So welcome this morning again. I'm going to go just real briefly through what we talked about last week. Um, the whole premise of this Bible study is to be looking at the biblical characters, characteristics in these women's lives. So we, I chose several women of faith. Um, and as I told you last week, I am kind of combining a few of them since our time is limited to five weeks. And if you may look at them and think, why in the world are they even grouped together? That doesn't make any sense. You have to come back and find out why. So it will make sense. Um, and uh, we want to have these character traits. We talked about the fact that we cannot become these type of women or have this character trait in our life without the Holy Spirit. We can't do it on our own. You know, how many times have we made New Year's resolutions or I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and never prayed about it and what happens? Two days later, if even that long, we've gone right back to doing whatever we said we were going to fix in our lives. So we can't fix us. The only one that's going to fix us is the Holy Spirit. So we had talked about that. So, um, those character traits that we're talking about, we're all made, we're uniquely made, and we're all different, and we all have different personalities. So some of us may exhibit a particular character trait more openly than another one, but all of these character traits that we talk about, every single one of them should be evidence in our lives because they are part of that fruit of the Spirit, and that fruit of the Spirit should be in each one of our lives. And again, we can't do it on our own. It's through this, um, the Holy Spirit. So as we go through these, you know, don't beat yourself up saying, oh, I'm just not quite that way. Pray about it. Are you spending time in God's Word? Are you working on that relationship? Because the closer we get to Christ and the more intimate we are with Him, and the more we're dying to ourselves and allowing that spirit to control us, then those, those traits should be coming through our lives um, more and more each day. So just a little kind of compact kind of what we've been talking about. And um, we're going to go today, we're going to be talking about um, love and being devoted like um, Ruth and Mary Magdalene. And they are two polar opposite kind of people. They are very different, but yet that loving characters, character trait and that being devoted to something you're going to see comes together very much the same. So as usual, I like to look up the Webster's Dictionary, and I like to look at what is you know, the Bible definition of something say, and then we'll take that and move on. So if you look at the Webster's definition of love, it says it's a feeling of strong attachment induced by that which delights or commands admiration, preeminent kindness or devotion to another, affection, tenderness, as the love of brothers and sisters. The second one is especially devoted, attachment to, tender, passionate affection, maybe as to one of the opposite sex. Um, affection, kind feeling, friendship, strong desire um, for someone, fondness, goodwill toward another, and um, to have a feeling of love and good affection. So we see affection, caring for, fondness, as the world would see it, which is still part of what the Bible says also. But in the Bible definitions, if we look there, about 311 times, if you look at the King James Version, you're going to find our English word for love. And then in the Greek language, and you may have heard these words before, there's four different kinds of love. We usually hear just three, but there are four. There's phileo, which is a brotherly love. Agape, which is the deepest love, and means doing good for another. And that agape love, usually no strings attached, as God loves us. Storge re, um, refers to loving one's relatives, and that usually goes along with it, that um, agape love. And then eros, which is used to usually talk about that physical love for um, the opposite sex or you know, a romantic type of love. So knowing what love is, and I don't think that's anything new to us. We all know what love is. Do we exhibit that love to everyone, including our enemies? That's a whole different ballgame. So let's just see how this goes. And I did... Check and double check all my references time so I didn't mess up like I did last week. I was like, what are you doing? But anyway, it happens. But since we're in Ruth, and it's all in the book of Ruth, can't mess up there. So this is the story. I'm just going to give a brief summary of the story of Ruth. So many of you have heard the story numerous times, so this won't be new to you. Some that may, maybe um, you've not really read through Ruth. But um, I'm just going to, like I said, I'm just going to kind of go through it. I'll give you a little bit of history of some of the people during that time. 
So this is something that I learned. I did not know what Ruth's name actually meant. And if you look at it, her name means friend or compassionate friend. And as we go through her story, we'll see how that character trait actually, it just matched her name so, so clearly. Um, so if we start in the opening of the account, we see that there was a famine in Canaan. So a man named Elimelech and his wife Naomi and his um, two sons, Malon and Shilion, decided that they were going to leave because the famine was so um, bad they had to go find some food. So they traveled and landed in the um, area of Moab. And just a little bit of history about the Moabites. So knowing this history, you kind of understand why there was a little bit of tension. This was a tribe that was descended um, from Moab, who is the son of Lot, who had that incestuous, incestuous relationship with his daughter. So we see that that was not a real good start to a people's. Um, and then when we read in the book of Judges, the king of Moab and the story of Balak, when he went to get Balaam and wanted him to curse the Israelites, that was the same people. During the time of the Judges, the Moabites were constantly oppressing the Israelites until finally um, the king of Moab was assassinated by Ehud, which was one of the Judges. And if you read that story where he stabbed him because he was so fat and he couldn't find the knife and all that. And then during the time of King David, the Moabites were actually then, they had been um, under the uh, rule of David and they were their vassals. So at that time they were not um, giving them a hard time. But they did this only until a civil war broke out. And remember, after David and after Solomon, the kingdoms divided to the northern and southern kingdom. So this was a great chance for the Moabites to kind of get out and go and attack and to revolt. And then we see later on in history that the southern kingdom finally fell under the Babylonians, um, King Nebuchadnezzar, and we, if you know that story. And then the Moab fled. And over time, their identity just kind of was lost. But that kind of just gives you an idea of who they were, where they started, and this is where they landed, and this is where Ruth is from. It is a land of idolatry, many gods, and all that. That's what they were believing in. So Elimelech and his family were definitely out of place there as a Jew. That's, they would not have believed the same thing as the Moabites. Carol, do we get a hand in out? Yeah, I'll give it to you when we're all done. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, continuing on with this story, we know that Elimelech dies. And um, so here's Naomi left as a widow with two sons. Her two sons take wives in, from Moab, um, and we know that their names, Orpah and Ruth. And they lived there for about 10 more years, and then as the story goes, we know that both of the sons died. Well, Naomi had gotten word that the famine was better, that they, there was food now, so she wanted to return home. So she got ready to return home, and she told Orpah and Ruth, you all go back home, go back to your mother's home, in hopes that they would be blessed and that they would have a good life, possibly find another husband, and be able to move on, and she was going to go back to her home. And as we know, Ruth said, no, I'm not going to go. And I'm going to read what she says verbatim so I don't mess any of it up. But she said, she, you know, she kept clinging to Naomi and saying, I'm not going to go. And please don't try to keep me from turning back. And she said, for where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do the same to me and more also, if anything but death separates me from you. So, you know, here is a picture of true love, true devotion, which even though we're talking more about love, we'll see that this is, she was totally devoted to Naomi um, in her, in her mother-in-law. And, you know, she turned, she turned, is turning away from what she grew up believing. She believed in those gods. This was her, this was her home and she believed all those things and she was willing to, even like last week, sacrifice what she knew to follow Naomi because she was so devoted to her. So as the story goes on, we know that they returned home. They were going back to Bethlehem and Judah. And when they got there, Naomi, uh, Ruth sent Naomi out to glean the fields. And in, when gleaning, that was the grains that would fall. When the, reap, the reapers would go out and get all the grain, and any of it that fell to the ground, they allowed these, the poorer people to come in and pick up these grains for themselves. And this is kind of a, it, this is a good picture of how we should treat the poor. We should help those who are in need, for sure. But the one thing that's also clear here, too, is unless they are not able 
body able to go out and work, those people still had to work. They still had to go up and gather that, that, that grain. It didn't just get given to them. And so I look at our, at our country today where we just give, 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 and people don't ever work. That's not right. Now, for those who are physically disabled and, and that, absolutely we should care for them. And also, originally, it was the church's responsibility to take care of people. It was not the government's responsibility. So I'm just throwing in a little added there. Um, we should take care. If we have people in our church that are physically unable to do things for whatever reason, we should be right there. But if you are physically able to go out and work, you should be out working. Sign it. <laughs> okay, so we know Ruth goes out. She begins gleaning the, this uh, grain that was following. And, you know, when, if you look in verse 3, it says that Ruth just happened into Boaz's land. Do you really think she just happened? You know, I know that's the, that's the English word we use there. But if we believe in a sovereign God, don't, I mean, I believe totally that God had a plan. He already knew where she was going to be, right? Divine he, yeah, divine appointment for sure, for sure. So I don't really think it was happenstance that she just landed in Boaz's um, fields. But, you know, Boaz caught a glimpse of her, and his heart kind of pitter-pattered, and he thought she was a very beautiful woman, and he wanted to know who she was. So Boaz then went to Ruth. He told her, hey, you stay in my field, stay near to my maids, and don't go anywhere else. And, you know, there were, there were times during those days that some of the maidens that would go into other fields to glean this would be attacked by some of the servants. And he did not want anything bad to happen to her, which he wanted to stay there. And Boaz was known um, for his strength, his integrity, and taking very good care of his servants. So we know that he was a, a very good and godly man. So when she gets home, she tells Naomi about her good fortune and how well things went, and Naomi was very delighted. So that night she tells um, Ruth, she says, you go in and you know clean yourself up, anoint yourself with olive oil, and then I want you to go back to the land tonight, and after all the men go to sleep, I want you to go down and lay down at Boaz's feet and uncover his feet. Now we think, that is something very strange to us. But that was not really a strange thing then. And what that was showing was that was showing Ruth's submission to him. And also, at the same time, she was asking him to be her protector. So it was not like a weird thing for her to have done that. And when he awoke and found her there, Boaz was absolutely delighted. And he even told her that he was glad that she was not going after other young men. And he knew that she was a good man. A woman of excellence and that she had a good and a moral reputation even though he didn't know her that well he knew that she he had heard um, through the grapevine or whatever you know how we hear and you know how people um, we we talk about people whether good or bad but people did talk very highly of her um, at this time he told her that he was one of her kinsmen but that he was not her closest kinsman and back in those days if a woman did not have children and her husband lost, it was customary for the closest kinsman to marry her and then they would have a child and that child would actually have the name from the husband who was killed or died or whatever. So that would keep that descendant name going. So um, he did say, I am your kinsman, but I'm not your closest. So the closest kinsman would have the first say. So um, that day he sent... Uh, Naomi home with, what they say, six <coughs> measures of flour, and she went home and waited with Naomi to see what was going to happen. Boaz then went down to the city gate, and at the city gate, that's where they would do all their business transaction, and he went up to this kinsman, and he said, would you be willing to buy Naomi's land? And the kinsman, I'm sure, thought at first, hmm, maybe. And he said, but if you buy her land, you also are taking care of Naomi, and... You must take Ruth also. Well, as he looked at it, he said, no, you know what? I can't do that because if I take that inheritance, it will mess up my own inheritance. So, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, again, in their custom, which would be very strange to us, we would never think anything about this, it was customary for the man who was giving something up to take off of his sandal, 
and throw it or give it to whoever he was giving it to. So that's what the kinsman did. He takes off the sandal, gives it to Boaz, and this was signifying to all those that were around, I am relinquishing, relinquishing my rights to this property, and which included marrying Ruth. And Elimelech said, I just want you to know that because of this, and as it says in um, the Bible, it says, I have also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow, widow of Malon, Malon, to be my wife and to restore the name of the deceased to his inheritance, so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the gate of his birthplace. And he said, you are my witnesses today. So that, they didn't have signed contracts. That was a witness in front of all these men because he gave them that sandal. This is the contract, and it is by binding. So because it was that way, we know as the story uh, closes that um, Ruth becomes his wife, and this then began the descendants of, or the lineage of David, because Boaz and Ruth give birth to a son named Obed. Obed is the father of Jesse, and Jesse is the father of David, who, if you keep going throughout the lineage, is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. So, I go back to that. Do you think this was happenstance? That she just happened in on his linen? Absolutely not. God had a plan. And you can see how God worked that out. Um, it's just a beautiful picture of this devotion and love for someone. So, she loved um, Naomi so much that, you know, she left this land. She knew everything about where she was probably very comfortable, had friends, had family. Um, but we also see some other character traits in her. Not only do we see this love and devotion, we also see her obedience. She was obedient to, to her mother-in-law who said, go do this. We see her kindness. It was throughout there. If you read um, the entire book, you'll see that she was very kind, um, submissive. And she also was very diligent because, I mean, she was willing to go in there and do that. And she worked all day long. It wasn't like she just went in there and picked up a couple grains and then, you know, 1030, I call it a day. She worked all day long. Um, so she was a very diligent person. Any other character traits that you can think of that you that we see in her life besides those few that I mentioned? Anything else you can think of? She was patient. She was patient because she was willing to wait. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Very humble. Humble. Because that is a humbling thing to do, to submit yourself like that and to be willing to do what she did. Yes? All right, well now let's go on. Let's look at devotion. We'll look at the definition of devotion. And again, like I said, even though love is what we were looking at in Ruth's life, we also see she was very devoted. But the definition of devoted in Webster's Dictionary is the fact, of, of the fact or state of being ardently dedicated and loyal. And that is like today's Webster's view. If you look, which I did, I took the older Webster Dictionary, long before all the political correctness came in, and the definitions in there were the state of being dedicated, consecrated, or solemnly set apart for a particular purpose, a solemn attention to the supreme being in worship, a yielding of the heart and affections to God, with reverence, faith, and piety in religious duties, particularly in prayer and meditation, an act of reverence, respect, and ceremony, ardent love or affection, attachment manifested by constant attention. And then if you look at the biblical definition and look how close it is to the old Webster de definition, ardent, often selfless affection and dedication as to a person or principle, religious ardor or zeal, strong attach attachment or affection marked by dedicated loyalty, religious zeal and piety and profound dedication, especially to religion. So I just, just, just in, it was just interesting to me to see how much Things have changed before political correctness was in, how everything was geared toward God. Um, I thought that was interesting. So we look at devotion, and devotion and love go hand in hand. If you truly love somebody, you're going to be devoted to doing whatever for their best interest. And if you are devoted to somebody, it's because you really love them. So we're going to look at the story of Mary Magdalene, and um, she... We don't really know a whole, whole lot about her prior to her encounter with Jesus. Um, she is mentioned in all four Gospels, and it's in Luke 8, 1 through 3, when we chronologically see where she kind of came into the picture, when it says Jesus began going around 
from one city and village to another proclaiming the good news. It tells us that the twelve disciples were with him and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene from the city of Magdala in Galilee, from whom seven demons had come out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household steward, and Susanna, and many others who were contributing to their support out of the private means. And this was very common for any type of a rabbi, and rabbi we know is teacher, and they called Jesus their rabbi, their teacher, for them to follow them and support them financially. Um, as we go on, we also see, in, and I'll, when you get my notes, you'll see this so you don't have to find every single verse, but we know that um, Mary was also um, present at the crucifixion. She, when others were, you know, hiding in fear, because some of them were afraid, and you can find that in Matthew 27, 56, and Mark 15, 40. She was present at his burial in Matthew 27, 61, and Mark 15, 47. She was at the empty tomb, and that's in Matthew 28, 1. She saw an angel after Jesus' resurrection in Matthew and Mark, and she saw Jesus himself after the resurrection, which is in uh, accounts in Mark and in John. And so we know that she was present throughout his ministry. And we're going to watch a little clip in a minute when we talk about her character trait because I think it will really, really show you how devoted she was to Jesus and why. Um, and knowing that she, you know, she traveled with Jesus, and we know from other accounts, not necessarily here, that Jesus had no home to call his own during that time. Um, they would either go into a home that where somebody would invite him in and to sleep, or they might have to sleep outdoors. We don't know, but we know that they didn't have a home that they were staying at the time. We also know that they were at serious risk, because if you go back and you study a little bit of the, the history and other bi uh, biblical texts, you'll see that um, John, the, he started his ministry after John the Baptist was um, arrested and was in jail. And John the Baptist had done the majority of his ministry um, in Herod's ter territory of Perea, Perea, I think that's how you say it, um, and Herod did not like that, and we know the story because he outed Herod, Herod, Herod threw him in jail. So while he was in prison and Jesus started his ministry, he was also ministering in areas of Herod's territory, only he was in Galilee. So Herod not only took this as like he was um, threatening, but it was, a, it was a challenge because, you know, how dare you go into my area and do this. So despite these risks, knowing that their lives could be in danger, Mary, as well as all of the other disciples, opted to stay with Jesus and continue to travel with him, showing that true devotion. Because you've got to be really devoted and really believing and really truly following someone to follow them under those circumstances. I mean, how many of us would be willing to go out and sleep, you know, on the ground every night? How many of us would be willing to risk our lives risk being arrested or whatever to follow something that we knew was true. So we see her her um, devotion to Jesus. Um, if you look back in chapter 7, um, starting in verse 40, we can see this love and devotion and what it really, really meant to have this love and devotion to somebody. And it, there it says, there was the Pharisee, and he was telling the parable about the two debtors. And one owed the money lender 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had no means of repaying this debt, the money lender forgave both of them their debt. So Jesus asked um, Simon, and this is Simon, a Pharisee, not uh, Simon Peter. He said, well, who do you think loved the money lender more? Well, Simon answered and says, well, I assume then the one that he forgave more. And Jesus said, you answer correctly. If we look at Mary Magdalene, Magdalene's life, even though we she was demon-possessed, and none of us probably can really relate to that particular thing, we can see her love and her gratefulness for what Jesus had done for her. Um, you know, Satan, even though we may not deal with a demon possession, we can still be oppressed and, and constantly Satan's after us. You know, he's relentless in trying to use pain and depression and discouragement to get us down and, and try to pull us away from Christ. Um, but we know that Jesus reaches out and he wants to pull us in with his grace. 
remembering that he is sovereign. He's the final judge. He's going to take care of all these things. And like we talked about last week, the same spirit, the same power that created the universe, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that same power is within us. If we don't squelch it and we allow the spirit to work, we have that same power in us. So we don't want to squish that power. Um, and in Scripture reminds us in 1 John 4, 4, little children, believers, dear ones, you are of God and you belong to him and have already overcome them, them as the agents of the Antichrist, because he who is in you is greater than he, Satan, than he is in, that is in the world of sinful mankind. And, you know, our devotion to Christ ought to be the same, whether we were, you know, saved as a small child without a lot of sinful baggage, as we would call it, or maybe some of us were saved out of very depraved life, as we would look at it, and um, had a lot of baggage. Regardless of when we were saved, our devotion to Christ ought to be the same. But I am sure that it's very easy, especially if we were saved as young children, and not, and not having ever experienced that bondage of drug addiction or that bondage of alcoholism or that bondage of sexual immorality or whatever we as humans consider the big sins, if we don't have those in our lives, I think often it's real easy to get complacent and not really understand and appreciate what Christ has done for us. And, you know, somebody's come out of a really, really bad area and their life has gone... Phew, I mean, you can see that fervor. But you know what? Ours should be the same. We should have that same devotion and that same um, love for him. Um, because what we need to meditate on is what Jesus has saved us from and what Jesus has saved us for. He has said, even if we only have that, you know, childlike baggage of sin and we've never done anything really, 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 really what we would say bad in our lives, God has still saved us from an eternal hell and an eternal separation from him. And he has saved us for a purpose. We all have a purpose. And if you were, any of y'all have been were here Sunday morning, Sunday night, and listened to our pastor's message about we are all gifted in some way. And there is something that God has called every single one of us to do. And repeating after him and what scripture says, so if I step on toes, anyway. If you are just sitting in a pew doing absolutely nothing, you are not walking where God wants you to walk because he has a gift for everybody. And I understand in this time when we've been kind of closed up, there hasn't been near the areas within the local body to serve, but there are still things that we can be doing and we ought to be serving. So, um, and that's, that is an outward sign of you know, being obedient and also showing that devotion to the Lord. So I, you know, in the, in the face of this angry mob, in the face of all that Mary went through, she was still willing to be devoted. And, you know, are there times that any, if you feel up to sharing, you don't have to, that you have backed off from sharing out of fear of what someone else might think or the words that may have come out? Has anybody experienced? I mean, I have. I know that there's been times where I have felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit to speak, and for whatever reason, my disobedience, I mean, that step on there, right there, my disobedience didn't speak out when I knew I should have, and that conviction, ooh, and I don't want to do that. I want to be obedient. When God says, go speak to that person, go speak to that person, or God says, do this, that we're obedient to do it. Anybody have anything they want to share? Or a time that you spoke out knowing full well that it might mean upsetting someone else? Or, you know, sometimes we speak out even though it could jeopardize our job. I just was talking to somebody yesterday. No, it was you. It was, it was Vicki who was saying, even in her public school, about she wasn't supposed to pray, but she was praying every day. And if it meant she lost her job, she was going to lose her job. But she was doing what she knew that the Lord had called her to do. Anything they want to share? All right. Another thing I want us to think about um, in, in going through this, if you look at the, at the references that I'll, you'll have on the handout, and if you want to go back and read them later, when they went to the tomb, they all went to the tomb, None of them went to the tomb 
expecting to find an empty tomb. I mean, even Mary, what did Mary go there to do? To prepare his body and anoint his body. They, and, and, and how many times, if you go back, if you read through the gospel, how many times did Jesus told him that he was going to die and he would rise again? And how many times did they miss it? So, you know, before, and before we start knocking them saying, well, how could you do that? You've been told and told and told. Well, how many times have we been told in a message to do or not to do and we turn around and do or not do or not believe? This, we do the same thing. But they did not expect to see an empty tomb, and so they were very shocked. And the only reference that we see, if you read in John 20, uh, 20, chapter 20, verse 8, there we see that they're finally beginning to understand when he says, oh, he's risen again, we get it. And after that, then they see it, and of course, you know, further um, passages where Christ appeared to them, and they, and they totally finally understand it. And, you know, if you look at different commentaries and they say, why didn't they get it? Why didn't they get it? And it, they just didn't really understand exactly what he meant. I mean, even when, when Lazarus died, and, you know, and both Mary and Mar Martha said, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. Well, don't you believe he's going to rise? Well, yeah, at the resurrection, he's going to rise. No, well, he can rise now. They just, we don't see, we just sometimes just don't get it. And I believe that, you know, as a maturing Christian, there's going to be things that we're going to read and some things we're really going to get, and then two years later we're going to read the same passage and be like, how did I miss that? And don't, don't want to do that with Christ's return? Oh, absolutely. Because I hear people say, yeah, they've been saying that for years. They've been saying that for years. One yeah. day it happens. It will. Mm -hmm. It will. And one day every knee is going to bow. And I put that several times because we look at some of these very pious remarks and the things that they're saying. And, and for us, too, one day we are going to bow. You know, you'll hear a song about, I'm going to dance for Jesus, and I'm going to do it. And we are. But we're going to bow first. No question, we're going to bow You first. know, another thing that I do is when I pray, I pray for a certain thing. And so many times in my life when I, my, my prayer is answered, God answers it up here because I'm so limited about where my brain goes that I think, okay, that's going to be where it'll be good. But that's not how God answers it. He answers it like, and it's amazing. He sees the overall picture. Right. I like it this often to a um, embroidery piece. You know, we look underneath and see all the stuff and all the junk and all the problems and all that. But God looks at the overview and he sees the beauty and he I knows see. the plan. I heard a children's sermon one time and it was about a jigsaw puzzle and God has the box top. And when we look at all those puzzle pieces, we can't see anything. But God knows what the picture's going to look like. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I hope that we will all live, as we've, as we've been talking about Revelation, we've been talking about the rapture, the second coming, and different, there are some things that are not absolutely clear. I know that um, it was mentioned that we would, that believers would be at the um, white throne judgment and that we would see loved ones, friends, cast into hell, and then after that, Jesus would wipe our tears. And we had several questions about that, and I began to research because I didn't know. I, I'd never heard that before. And I researched and researched and researched and asked several people, and this is kind of where I've landed, and right or wrong, I don't know. Scripture doesn't really come right out and say we're going to be there. However, if you look at previous texts and other texts, it says that once the rap the the church is raptured, we will never be away from Christ again. Well, if Christ is going to be at the judgment, then where are we going to be if we're never going to be separated from him? Good point. I don't know that. I'm just saying, I'm just, just to be thinking about it. But regardless of whether we are there or not, we ought to live with that thought of knowing that we have friends and family that are going to be cast into the lake of fire. What are we doing now? So that that doesn't happen. Um, my heart has been so convicted about not sharing and not being concerned that we just go about our daily business and we are so wrapped up in doing this and doing that and being in church and our fun little happy family, we forget that there are <clears throat> millions and billions of people that are going to spend eternity in hell and what are we doing? Whew, my heart's been convicted. So I just leave that with you and thinking about that. Whether we are or not, we ought to live concerned about that. So I know it's very easy right now and the times that we're in, our country is an absolute mess. 
It seems like every single day we see something more evil and more evil and more evil and more evil. And it's real easy to get downcast. It's real easy to get depressed. If you're watching the news every day, stop. <laughs> Don't, because you are going to live in an absolute state of depression. But if we look at these promises that God fulfilled from Genesis through, is there any promise in here that he did not fulfill? No. He fulfilled. Every promise he made happened. Did he promise he's coming back and he's going to write it all? He did. So we can live in that hope. We can live in that hope. So that, that's the joy we want to close in, in, in knowing the hope that God offers us if we are his children. So he said he's coming back, and we can trust and believe and just know that he is coming back. And in the meanwhile, what are we doing? What has he called us to do? We ought to be doing what he's called us to do.